Hello everyone, and welcome to Unit 3, Ecology. I'm your teacher, Mrs. Reiswijk, or Mrs. R for those that can't say Reiswijk. Let's get started. Starting with Section 1, Introduction to Ecology. Ecology is the scientific study of how living organisms interact with each other and their environment. You guys will be asked to watch a short video clip of the movie Lion King. That's why the picture is here. And you will be asked to identify the organisms that are in the movie as well as some of the environment's factors. Starting with biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic factors are the living properties of an environment, while the abiotic are the physical or the non-living properties of an environment. So the biotic would be things like the animals and the plants within the environment, and the abiotic would be things like temperature and weather and how they affect the environment. We'll also be covering the levels of organization. As you can see here, it looks kind of like a pyramid, starting with an individual and moving all the way up to a biosphere. So individuals make up populations, populations make up communities, communities make up ecosystems, ecosystems make up biomes, and biomes make up the biospheres. Starting with populations, population is a group of organisms belonging to the same species. Here are a few examples, like the monarchs, the meerkats, the frogs, etc. Then there's a community. Communities are Populations of different species that occupy the same area and interact with one another. Like you see here in these pictures, the lions and the wildebeest, the sheep and the cows, etc. An ecosystem is a natural unit composed of all living forms in an area, functioning together with all of the abiotic components of the environment. So ecosystems take into account the living and the non-living factors of the environment. A biome is an ecological formation that exists over a large region. Examples of these would be a rainforest, the desert, or the mountains. A biosphere is the portion of the planet that's occupied by living matter. The Earth would be considered a biosphere. So section 2, populations. We'll go a little bit more into depth about populations. So again, to define population, it's a group of organisms belonging to the same species, all living in the same area and interacting together. And there's three key features of a population. The first one is the population size, simply how many are there? Population density, how many are in one area? And then dispersion, how are they arranged in a space? So population size is pretty self-explanatory, how many are there? The population density is the number of individuals per unit area or the volume of the population. So here's an example of sharp-tailed grouse in the state of South Dakota. As you notice here on the eastern half of the state, there's lower densities, but as you move west, they get higher in density. So out west, they have a hunting season for them to help control the population numbers. And then dispersion. How are the individuals distributed within a population? There's three different kinds. There's random, uniform, and clumped, and their names are pretty much self-explanatory. They tell you exactly how the dispersion is taking effect. First one, random distribution. It's unpredictable spacing. It's the least common, and good examples would be dandelions or oysters. A good picture of dandelions here. When they go to sea, the wind blows them, and there's no rhyme or reason to where the seeds fall and where the organism takes its roots and grows. This picture here is a good example too, where some of them are close together and some of them are further apart. I couldn't find a good picture of oysters, but oysters are um, a good example of random distribution because they are lifted and taken by the ocean currents and kind of scattered wherever. And there's, again, no rhyme or reason to where they land. They are just taken by the wind currents or the ocean currents, just as the dandelions are taken by the wind. And then there's clump distribution. It's the most common type of distribution. The distance between the neighboring individuals is minimized, so they live close together. 
Um, it's characterized by patchy resources. An example of these would be African wildlife during dry seasons, like the elephants and the antelope, wildebeest, mines. They all are going to be found clumped together around the water sources because that's their only source of water that you need to be able to survive. Um, wolf packs are also another good example of clump distribution. They stay together for protection reasons, to raise their young, and then also for hunting. And then there's uniform distribution. It's when the organisms are evenly spaced. The distance between the neighboring individuals is maximized and the competition for resources is, is quite high. So you see here with the penguins on the lower right that they are an equal distance apart because when they're sitting on their young and their eggs, um, they're very aggressive and they're very protective of them. So there's at least a meter's distance within them so they can each raise their young um, comfortably and they all can be happy and content. And then a good example, especially around here, would be corn and bean fields. The machinery, the planters, are set up to precisely set these seeds in the ground an optimal distance from each other. If they were closer, they would be overusing the nutrients in the soil and the plants wouldn't um, produce a good crop. But as a precise distance apart, each plant can have sufficient amount of resources and produce a good crop. And then there's population growth. When the birth rate is higher than the death rate, the population grows. So an example would be my family. My husband, it was first my husband and I, and then we had our daughter Shelby, and then we had our son Cooper. So the our family is growing. The population numbers in our family are growing because we have no deaths and our, we have more births than death. There's two different types of population growth. There's exponential and there's logistic. Exponential is when a population steadily increases. There's ideal living conditions. The population grows larger and larger and the growth rate increases. And when you graph this, it looks like a J-shaped curve. Because over time, the population keeps growing. But then there's times where the population gets limited, and these are simply called limiting factors. When a living or a non-living property of a population environment regulates the population growth or it lowers the population growth. This could be due to like the food supply or the limited space. Then there's logistic, logistic growth where a population grows until it reaches its carrying capacity, and this is identified by the capital letter K. On a graph, this makes an S-shaped curve. Higher population levels increase competition for limited resources, and this leads to lower growth rates, and eventually the growth rate will stop, and increasing the population becomes stable. So that's why it makes the S-curve. It'll start, it grows, and then it kind of tops off here, and it'll remain there as resources allow. And that's, a, a, that's the maximum amount of population that the environment can handle. Other factors that affect the population are density-dependent factors and density-independent factors. Density-dependent factors promote competition between the members of the same population for the same food supply or the same root resource, like the food supply. And density-independent factors are influences outside the population um, through other means, like the weather. And individuals can be, or organisms can be identified as either K strategists or R strategists. K strategists are species with a long lifespan, they take a long time to reproduce, and population numbers are smaller. While R strategists are species that reproduce quickly, they have a short lifespan and um, are, have, are limited by density dependent factors. An example of a K strategist would be an elephant. Um, they have a long lifespan. They can live to be around 30 or even up to 50, I believe. And they take a really long time to reproduce. They only produce one calf about every other year. And then their population numbers are much smaller when you compare them to an R strategist like the mosquito. A mosquito reproduces very quickly. A female can lay anywhere from 100 to 300 eggs at a time. And she lives for anywhere from 3 to 100 days. So in that lifetime, she can lay up to 3,000 eggs. Um, and, she, and they're limited by density-dependent factors. So if they don't have food, they can't reproduce. 
So if, when you compare the case strategist, the elephant that had only produces one offspring every other year as opposed to the elephant, or not the elephant, the mosquito who produces like 3,000 offspring in a matter of 100 days, it's a vast difference. When thinking about population, it's important for ecologists to do um, sampling where they can estimate the number of the population. The population is counted in a specific area. That's what sampling is. The number is multiplied to calculate the total number of individuals in an area. It's used when it's impossible to count the entire population. When they're counting worms or bacteria or even fish, there's no way for them to count every single individual. So they use a technique called mark and recapture. A select few are captured and then they mark them. And then they come back the next season and a few are recaptured as well as some new ones and then they mark those. And then they use a formula to determine the number in the population. And this is used for roaming animals like mountain lions and elk. And you guys will actually be doing a mark and recapture technique um, to estimate the amount of a population. You actually have beans in a bag and you'll have to estimate how many are in there by using this technique. But this concludes section 3.1 and 3.2 of your ecology notes.